Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Get Real with Casey Kasem, the podcast taking a look behind the scenes of the fantasy football industry through interviews with some of your favorites in the business. For this episode, I got to talk with someone I saw having a great time at the Fantasy Football Expo. He responded to one of my tweets with a hilarious comment, and I knew I needed to get this guy on my show. Joey Wright joins me for this chat, someone you may know from Front Yard Fantasy, the pretend GM show with football guys, and the Better Sports Network. We discussed watching IMDb's top 250 movies, making content while at the Fantasy Football Expo, rock musicals, his Start, Sits, and Salutations series, working as a film projectionist, and a ton more. Give Joey a follow on Twitter at DJoeyWright. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at DKCKasem and the podcast at GetReal underscore pod. Get Real with Casey Kasem is a proud member of the DAP Network. Dallas area listeners, come check out the Scott Fishbowl Live Draft at Community Beer Company on July 15th, 2023 from noon to 4 p.m. Drafts are already full, but this event is open to the public. There will also be a silent auction at this event, including subscriptions and draft guides from some of your favorite fantasy football websites, merch, items from local businesses, autographs, and more. All of the proceeds from the auction will go to fantasycares.org. Hope to see you at Community Beer Company on July 15th. And now, here's my conversation with Joey Wright on Get Real with Casey Kasem. Joey just snuck up on me, so... It's cool. It's cool. Um, Joey, I'm so happy to have you here. Uh, I wanted to let you know before we really got started that I saw you at the expo last year and it was like that moment where I was like, I need to have that guy come on my show. Now it took forever, (laughs) but I got you here. So I'm excited. Um, So before we actually get into like more deep into our conversation, let's start with the fantasy football part, which is how did you find this amazing game of fantasy football? Um, so I checked a while back. I know the first league I ever played in was on Yahoo. And I, it, my register shows like 2009. Um, but I didn't really get into it in 2000, until 2011. Um, kind of I think when a lot of people did, when the league came on FX, that show uh, with Mark Duplass. I was a huge fan of Mark Duplass from um, all his independent film work. And then he had this show on FX. I'm like, oh, well, check it out. And then... I was like, well, I have friends just like that that are raunchy and are, you know, crude and would be a lot of fun to play in fantasy football with. So we started a league in 2011. It's the Golden Gnome League. Still going strong today. Um, So, yeah, and that's how I got into it. Uh, And from there, it just, you know, when you really want to beat the people you love the most Mm -hmm. to just give them maximum amount of suffering in the most wonderful way possible through fantasy sports, you just get really into it. And um, I just found myself listening to podcasts. Okay, now I'm going to get uh, draft guides and just getting more and more into it. Uh, so, and then from there, just, you know, landed my first gig in the industry. And it seems like it's all been spiraling up since there. In that first league that you were ever in, do you remember what the setup was like or any of the mm-hmm. players that you drafted or anything like that? So I remember I was adamant about drafting Michael Vick. Um, it was when he was with the Eagles and I took him in like, I think like the second round. So I, you know, now I'm the kind of guy that will wait on quarterback. I, I don't usually reach for my quarterbacks. Uh, so I remember grabbing Michael Vick. So it'd been 2011. So he had a really good season 2011, if I remember. Um, and, but it was a basic redraft league. I don't think we had any PPR, uh, you know, two running backs, two wide receivers, a flex defense kicker quarterback, uh, really, really standard stuff. So when you were growing up, were you into football or how did that come yeah. out? So I was a massive Florida Gator fan when I was a little kid. Um, and the Florida Gators, the love of that, because I live in uh, Orlando, Florida. So just a little bit outside of Gainesville. Um, that love of the Florida Gators, Emmett Smith was like my first favorite football player. And then when he went to the Cowboys, I became, as a child, a Cowboys fan. And, uh, you know, I hate to say I was a bandwagon fan, but I feel like since I followed Emmett over, it's not so much of a bandwagon fan, but um, I did actually hop off the Cowboys uh, bandwagon when I moved in with my dad in Montana because he was a big Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan. Um, and I was always kind of destined to be, to be a Buccaneers fan. I'm not sure how blue I can get on the show, but um, I was actually conceived at a Bucks game at halftime. <laughs> so um, it's, it's always been a kind of been in my blood, I guess you could say. Uh, so, yeah, so I've, I've been a Bucks fan since then, though. But uh, Dallas has always been a team that's been close to me as well. Okay, I was going to I'll cut you some slack there. I'm a huge Dallas Cowboys fan. I'm from the area, so that's okay. But 
it's okay. You are not a bandwagoner. You followed a player, which is awesome because that's a lot yeah. of how fantasy, fantasy football goes, right? So mm-hmm. we have favorite players that we end up liking. Are there any players nowadays that you're just a fan of watching? Maybe not just for fantasy football purposes, but just in general, a fan of watching their play. Yeah, I mean, I love watching Damian Pierce. I I, <laughs> I have numerous t-shirts um, touting him. Just his ability to run the ball and break through the line is fantastic. I was super sad last year that he was only limited to 10 games. Um, I'd seen him a little bit at Florida and was just like, please, just I wish this kid would play more when he was at Florida. And then when he got to the NFL, I was like, oh, man, look at all this mileage he's going to get now. But first season didn't pan out as well. But I just love watching that kid run the ball. <laughs> OK, yeah, I you know what? I'm going to go with that. I, I don't actually pay that much attention to the Texans, to any. It's just, I mean, that's why I'm interviewing people and not giving fantasy <laughs> advice. But you brought up getting a gig in the industry. So, how did you actually first find out about the world of online fantasy football fans coming together? So I want to say the first um, I've been listening to um, the CBS um, fantasy football today podcast um, since probably 2012, uh, 2012, 2013, somewhere in there. Um, I used to work for Barnes and Noble and I worked in the receiving room. So all the books that would come in, I would receive them and I could wear headphones and I would listen to fantasy football podcasts at that time. And so fantasy football today was the first one I ever listened to with Dave Richard and Jamie Eisenberg. And um, I've never really faltered from that. I've always kind of, I still do listen to that show. They feel like they're, they're my friends. And I've actually kind of become friends with Dave Richard, which is crazy to say that. But um, yeah, so that's how um, I started listening to fantasy football podcast. What was that question again? I'm sorry. Well, it's more like, and that's good. Cause that's a, that's a good segue into what the question it oh, has. How it goes, yeah. How did you get, well, yeah. How, well, first of all, how did you even find out that, there was a community like that out there. Like how, when you found out yeah. that there were so many like-minded people or at least had the same interests that you did, how did that come about? So I, I would say I, I played in a lot of like home leagues to start out with. And so, but I was always seeming to be the person, even though I might not have won the leagues, the one that was most passionate about it. And you have to wonder, okay, are there people out there like me? And through that podcast, there's a podcast league through CBS. And I got in one year uh, by actually writing a love letter to Dave Richard, um, (laughs) which it's kind of funny to look back on that now. Um, And from there I I met, I think Zach Berger was one of the first people I met um, through that league. Um, And the same year I joined that podcast league, I joined what's called the Raz Bowl from Raz Ball. Like they have a little industry tournament. Uh, I think they have like uh, 290 teams, I think play in it every year. And I got an invite to that. It was my first industry league invite. Uh, first year didn't do so well. Uh, the second year I played in it, though, um, I did really well. I like was winning the league for the 11 straight weeks, and I was having a lot of fun with it. I got my kids involved in it. Um, and at the end of the season, um, Blair Williams and um, who was it Donkey Teeth reached out to me from Rasball, and they're like, "Hey, would you want a job writing for us? Like, you, we know you used to be a film writer. Like, any interest in writing fantasy football? You're a lot of fun. You would kind of fit our whole vibe here." And that's how I got my first writing gig in the industry. Yeah, that is really cool to to like see that these industry leagues and stuff can actually help better you know better you in the terms of putting out fantasy content. You spoke of film and being a film critic, being a film buff and putting out content like that. What was the backstory of putting out content like that? How did you come about putting out film with film? Yeah. Um, so I was, I worked in the, um, one of my favorite movies is high fidelity. It's about a guy that works in a record store. So one of my dreams in my life was always to work in like a record store. The closest I got to that is I was the music and DVD manager for Barnes and Noble for six of my seven years there. Uh, and I was just in the department one day stocking movies on the shelves and we had like the IMDb 250 section, like the two top 250 films and ID IMDb's database. And I was logging them on there and I'm like, man, I've only seen about half of these. Maybe I should sit down and try to watch all of them. And I just kind of pitched it as a blog. And then, um, Jerry green from ESPN two, um, was one of my regular customers and he's like, hey, would you like to do an interview with me about this? And I'm like, sure. And so he interviewed me about sports movies. 
And we sat down, talked about sports movies. It's fantastic sit down. Some of them, he's right through Lando Magic. And I really just always admired him. Um, he's since passed away, which is super sad. About three years ago, he passed away. Uh, and from there, uh, the blog got picked up. Somebody actually optioned to create a website around me. And we created the uh, flick250.com which no longer exists. I can get into why, but uh, flick 250com <laughs> you you where it was movie reviews in 250 words or less. And this was really kind of even before Twitter when I had the uh, film website. So it was kind of like the whole like short form content was uh, really interesting. And I really wish it would have gone longer. But so the story, the quick story of how 250 folded. Um, he was one of my wife's best friends. It was her fiance. And we, he was the tech side of it. And I was the sole writer for the site. And one day he just was, I just could not get in contact with him. I don't know if he got deported or what still have never heard from him. Uh, Chris, if you're out there, yeah. still waiting for you to put the site back up. <laughs> Chris, thanks for yeah, listening. Chris, Chris. Come on, man. Um, <laughs> no. but yeah, that, that really burned me actually for a long time yeah. because I felt, you know, I had put two years of all of these really great, you know, I don't know if they were great, but this film journalism out there went to a bunch of film festivals, you know, met some actors. It was really exciting. So some directors as well. And then at the end, I was just like, man, I felt like this was all for nothing. And so I was like, you know, I'm just going to get married, have a family now. And I really thought I would probably never do any type of content again. And little, little did I know there would be like this fantasy football content industry that would kind of pop up out of nowhere. And when they reached out to you to write, fantasy football content. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you have that in the back of your mind that I don't want to get burned again and, and things like that? Or were you going into it with an open mind? Like this is a completely different situation or how, how are you thinking? So my wife, she had said, when I brought it up, she's like, I can think you're ready now because for the longest time I'd had people come up to me um, from the film industry and they would say, Hey, would you want to write for my site? And I'd say, no, I just don't have any interest in doing it. Uh, but when Razball came to me, it was a different, it was something different and it was something I was excited about. My wife's like, I think you're ready. And so I didn't really have any hesitation. I was really excited to do it. Um, I think I went out and bought, um, a microphone, a camera, like I was ready to go as soon as they told me, uh, to, that I was going to start doing content. <laughs> <laughs> How is it different going from writing about films to writing about fantasy football content? Like, is there any major differences that you have to go through? You know, at first I would say they were night and day because I would say film was all about feeling and fantasy football is about facts. And I don't know how different that is anymore because a lot of this, yeah, we're basing some stuff off facts when we're doing all of our, you know, projections and busts and sleepers, but a lot, you know, some of it is feeling too. Like, Feelings will guide us to certain players like Damian Pierce. You know, he's not the greatest running back in the league, but that feeling, I have a feeling about him. And there's something that will make me look into those stats even more on Damian Pierce to kind of to break the code, to figure out, okay, why is it that I love this guy? So at first I would say they're so different, but I don't think they're a whole lot different now. But for me, with my film writing was all about feeling of how the movies made me feel, um, what the director made me think, you know, so. And buying a microphone and getting all set up, being in front of the camera or being behind the microphone, was that something you were comfortable with or was that something that you had to kind of work your way into? I would say that I was, it, it's funny because I was a theater in high school. I was like a, a, a theater kid. And so the getting in front of a camera was different, but it didn't take me long to just kind of click with it. Like I enjoy it. I have fun. Um, I really only get butterflies when I go on a show with someone for the first time. So uh, but, yeah. hey, we got you we got yeah. you i some people say i'm funny i don't think i am you are but, hilarious no, and am. well i was kind of gonna <laughs> ask, i was gonna kind of ask you have you always been kind of outgoing and and friendly and out there you know talking with people and conversing and yeah and so that? from a young age my mom and i we moved around a lot so i had to be friendly because i needed to, i was going to new school so i would make friends quick uh but you know i always found the best way to make new friends was to kind of make them laugh. And I will say I had the coolest mom growing up. Like she would let me go to bed on Saturdays at around like nine o'clock. And then she would come wake me up at like 11, 1130. So I could watch Saturday night live well before I should have been watching it. Like with the Chris Farley, Adam Sandler, David Spade, oh, yeah. uh, Mike Myers, 
uh, Saturday Night Live. That was kind of my first introductory class getting into um, SNL. And then I did, you know, theater through high school. I was SNL obsessed. Would do like any cabaret night. I was writing skits um, and then put together our portfolio, did improv comedy after high school. Yeah, just I just ate it up. Do you ever wish that you could be on SNL or be like, maybe one day? It was my it was my lifelong dream to be on SNL. I think as I as I became a senior in high school, I realized I really enjoyed writing more than I liked acting uh, and directing. Because I sometimes like I'm not sure I'm the best vehicle sometimes to put forth the idea that's in my head. Um, like I have a little thing that I do that starts in salutations where I go out into nature and talk to animals and stuff. And you know, people are like, "Oh, where'd you get that? Is that a character?" it's just me it's just <laughs> parts of me extremely exaggerated right uh, you know like uh, steven johnson i don't know if you know steven johnson uh he's been in the industry quite a bit when we went to expo for the first year and i knew nobody there like i knew no one steven like hit me in the arm because i was so wide-eyed and like <gasps> i was so <laughs> happy and he's like you're killing me joe you're and this was before i even had the character but my voice kind of went up an octave because i was so excited to see everyone and Steven's like, that's not how you talk. Like, I know you. What's going on? And so it all kind of started snowballing from there. And uh, when I joined Front Yard Fantasy, I just asked our uh, founder, J. J. L. Garofalo. I was like, hey, I've got an idea. Can I go to a park and film something? He's like, Joe, you can do whatever you want. I, you know, and then I don't <laughs> think he knew what I was going to bring back to him. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, I remember like people just retweeting like crazy whenever a video gets posted and. Yeah. I, I, that's what I was going to ask you about. That was actually going to be the next thing to talk about was start uh, sit. Uh, can't even talk. Did yeah. you do that on purpose? Sorry. No, <laughs> start worst sit, name ever. <laughs> <show>. Salutations. <laughs> anyway, if I can actually get back to talking. <laughs> when you came up with that idea and it's you started seeing people respond to it, what were you thinking at that time when it started picking up steam? So I do. I shoot it with my best friend, Shervon Basteo. Um, he's the guy that's behind the camera. If you ever hear a voice, that's him. Uh, he is just as much of it as I am because he's the one feeding because he we were in theater together. So he knows how to get the best out of me. So he's the one like calling stuff out to me to try to get me to improv with him, try to get to act with him. Uh, and, you know, just doing that with him has been the greatest joy. So when people actually started finding, you know, joy in it themselves, I was actually really surprised. I thought it was kind of dumb, but apparently really people really responded to it. And listen, it makes people happy. I have my own catchphrase now. Like when I go to Expo, everyone's like, oh, hi, oh, hi. <laughs> and it, it's kind of fun. It's great. And last year I got to do it live at Expo, which I think was a good decision. Um, it was. You I was having... on this podcast because of it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. No. I did, though. Um, before, it's funny, um, before... I came downstairs, down the elevator. I was having like a full blown panic attack upstairs. Like I was crying. It was oh, insane. Man. And I just think it was it look in the moment. I was like, what's going on? What's going on? And yeah. I think it was the second time that something has moved me so much where the first time was when I was in theater and it was my last day of my senior year. And I just broke down because I was like, I finally found my family. I finally found my place where I should be. And looking back at what happened at Expo before I went downstairs. I think that's what it was. I was like, oh my gosh, I think this is it. This is my next thing. Like, this is my new family. This is where I should be. This is what I should be doing. Let's not mess this up. And I think the stress of it kind of got to me a little bit. But then like my team from FYF, they came upstairs and they were like, all right, let's do this. And I'm like, all right, let's go. And, and then, then, yeah, that's awesome. It turned out pretty good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Having a team like that too, that'll come and support yeah. you and kind of, what is the importance of making sure that you align yourself with a good group of people when you're putting out content? Um, I mean, whew, that's a great question. I think just having people that believe in me, mm -hmm. like as far as starts and salutations goes in, in a good way, they don't really put hands on it too much. Um, Jay Felicio, he helps me with um, a lot of the editing and some of the thumbnails and the graphics. But and Jay did shoot the expo episode. He was the one following me around at expo and he was recording and Jay did a fantastic job um, filling in for Siobhan. Uh, but as far as, you know, it's tough to say like, yeah. Yeah. But, it, but it is awesome that they have, have your back and, and are able to do yeah. that. So it is good to 
at least find people in the industry. There are so many nice people in this industry and you're bringing up the expo and it, this podcast sounds like an ad for the fantasy football expo. It's yeah. not, but it's such an amazing event and it's so just so important to be able to go out and meet people, people you don't even know and, and get to know them. Uh, yeah. What was the whole like first time you went to the expo and you're like walking in, I know you were, whoa, you know, but I was, w what exactly is that feeling like, especially for like somebody that's going for, for their first time? So I had only heard of the expo as something people were going to, and I was excited. I was like, okay, I think if I want to maybe, I don't know, just not even see this as a career. I kind of just wanted to meet the people, yeah. uh, especially I mentioned Dave Richard, who I just listened to for a decade and I'd kind of set it up with them. I was like, Hey Dave, I'm going to be at the expo. I know you're doing the King's classic draft. Uh, would it be cool if like, can I come and watch you draft? And I didn't know that you can just walk in there and watch him. <laughs> and Dave's like, absolutely, Joey, you can come in. And um, I was super nervous to meet Dave. I mean, this is someone that I'd listened to for 10 years. And, you know, you sometimes you put people on a pedestal before mm -hmm. you, you get to know them and whatnot. And so I get <clears throat> to the gold room and I, I watch Dave walk in and I was like, okay, cool. So I'm just going to hang back. And then I kind of scoot over. And at this time he's standing in a circle with like, Mike Clay, Andy Barron's. I don't know any of these guys at this point. Um, Bob Harris, and I, but I knew who they are. They just don't know who I am. And Dave sees me and he's like, hey, J does everybody here know Joey Wright? And he goes one by one around the circle and introduces me to everyone. And I was like, wow, that was really cool. He didn't have to do that. And then I kind of pilter off a little bit because he was about to start drafting, but I guess they had a delay. So he said, come with me. And then for about 15 minutes, him and I walked through the Hall of Fame room together. Just him and I, and it was empty at that time. And I was, I barely spoke. I really, I just was <laughs> like, oh, I'm not going to say anything. And, you know, had one of the greatest experiences. And like, I do think I did make a friend that day. And now, like, looking ahead two years now, like, I'm in the Kings Classic this year. I got my own invite. Um, Dave and I are going to meet before the draft and strategize. He's been on the Front Mirror Fantasy Show a few times. Um, when I got hired by football guys, like, he gave me a phone call to make sure that. I was, you know, happy and that I knew what was happening. And so it's just the people like that. That was one instance of meeting someone there. But who I really met at Expo the first year was the team of Front Yard Fantasy. And with Simon, uh, JL, Josh Fuster, Jay Felicio, Tim Wright, who's not actually my brother, but people say he's my brother. <laughs> um, so just meeting that whole team and then Maria, just I didn't even get to meet Maria. I don't think I said met Maria. I'm going to their wedding here in October. Uh, <laughs> but meeting them was really great. And it was the only company I reached out to after the Expo and said, listen, if there's anything you think I could ever do for you guys, like I would love to become a part of whatever you guys are doing. If you ever see a role for me. And it took about two months of phone calls with JL <laughs> to, <laughs> for us to be like, okay, I think we could bring you on. And we didn't really know what I was going to do at that time. And then one week later I said, Hey, can I go to the park and film something? And there <laughs> That is super awesome. See, guys yeah. and gals, going to the expo pays off because you get to meet people that can potentially help get your stuff out there. And that's great. And and it, they are a great group of people over there as well. So y you brought up football guys and front yard mm -hmm. fantasy and having all these different places that you put content out, you you do all that. How do you balance your, you know, your life outside of fantasy and your life with fantasy football? So I have a wonderful wife and two daughters um, and they are the ones that really kind of help me balance it. And I have a full-time job too. Um, I'm a water technician outside of this. Um, the hardest thing is definitely the kids and the wife, like just making sure that they get their time. Uh, you know, finding the balance is the one thing I was at last year at Expo. Uh, man, we can mention Expo again. I sat down with Jim awesome. Coventry and Jim and I had a really great conversation about being a dad in the industry and how, you know, definitely you want to put your best foot forward in the industry, but being a dad comes first. And I think that conversation with him really helped me find a good path. And then someone I worked with at Barnes and Noble named Phil Lebetsky actually played Florida uh, football at Florida state, uh, which anyone that knows me knows I don't have too much of a love of Florida state, but I do love Phil Lebetsky. And he taught me the, like the, I guess the example of a pie. And just to make sure that your pieces of the pie are the correct size for everything in your life. And if you ever feel like anything's getting too big or too small, you got to kind of readjust that. And so like, I always make sure that the family size is 
as big as possible, especially in the off season. And, you know, during the season, it, it can kind of get a little smaller and, but always making sure that my kids, you know, my oldest daughter and I, Tristan, we go on hikes all the time. And like, that's really special for her and I, my youngest, she doesn't really seem to like me yet. Although she now <laughs> loves Mario. And since I okay. can do like the Bowser voice, she's like, okay, let's play Bowser and princess peach. And so that's been our new thing. And she actually seems to like me now, but so that's kind of cool. But. So being from Florida and kind of also, cause I do research before this. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Um, no, but I, you guys into Disney, Disney family type of stuff. What mm -hmm. exactly is for those of us who don't go to Disney and don't know that experience, how's going with the fam? It's great. Um, we've still not taken my youngest cause the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. uh, but my oldest has been to Disney probably 30 times. Uh, cause we got annual passes at that time. Uh, I, you know, being a Floridian going to Disney is not going all day for the most time. <laughs> you should just go after four o'clock or you do it in shifts, especially when you have a two year old for the, was it 2019? Uh, we had annual passes that whole year and my daughter was two, which means she got in free the whole year and we would go two, three times a week for about four hour shift. We'd ride rides. Uh, you can bring your own food into Disney. Uh, I don't know if people know that, but you don't have to I buy the Disney food. So we would never <laughs> actually buy the like chicken fingers and things like that. If we did a Disney meal, we went to like their, their good dining establishments, the character dining or like the be our guest, which is like the bell's castle. We would go there. Uh, we weren't Disney adults. Like we had kids, but like, it's pretty awesome. I'll, we do say that like our second daughter was like a Disney baby because like we had such a great night at Epcot as a mommy and daddy night. That <laughs> There we go. You know? There we go. There we go. <laughs> when I forgot. So that's why I'm asking you this. But do you I maybe I haven't asked, but do you remember the year that you started writing fantasy football content? It would have been. So this is 2023. Ren. It would have been 2020, I believe. OK, so 2021. that's 21. I like that. Yeah, I, because. Well, the 2020, 2021 time frame, I think a lot of people were, you know, right when the pandemic first started, especially a lot of people had time. Why not? And it's cool to see how many people came out of that that are such awesome, awesome content creators, and including, you know, you when you're putting out content, were you putting out content d during the pandemic or was it or like when it first started or was it? No. Yes. Yeah, it, was, it would have been during the pandemic because there mm -hmm. was definitely. Um, I had had a couple surgeries and then that following year. So it would have been 2021 was my first year. So yeah, there was still, you know, everyone was wearing masks and mm -hmm. you know, the pandemic was very much in full flux. And I wrote the waiver wire article for my first year um, and every week. Was it, is it different writing now than it was writing at that time? Or is it pretty much the same for you? Um, I would say that I get to get out a little bit more. So as far as, before I was really just kind of writing from my point of view, but now I'm able to get out with my friends and I'm able to go to the sports bars, not as much as I would like to, but, and so I get their feedback. So, you know, even though I'm talking to all these experts and all of, you know, my friends in the industry every week, sometimes it really is great to get out and talk to people that are not in the industry yeah. to hear what they're saying. Cause there's a, like, I have a friend, I mentioned Siobhan, huge Dolphins fan. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, huge Steelers fan. He is who I get most of my Steelers knowledge from because he sits there and he goes through, every little bit of everything with the Steelers. And I'll go to him. We'll have an hour long conversation. I'll get more out of that conversation with him than I would if I sat online and read two hours of articles about the Steelers. Perfect. Yeah. And another reason that the expo is awesome for people who aren't putting out fantasy content, but just like to talk about fantasy football. So definitely the expo I, I'm bringing it back again. Hey, we can bring it into Scott Fishbowl as well if we want to, because that's something that's a, a roar right now as well. Mm -hmm. Do you have a connection with Scott Fishbowl? I applied for a couple of years mm -hmm. and didn't get in. It was before I would say the first year I joined Raz Bowl, someone mentioned, oh, there's this thing called the Scott Fishbowl. It's pretty big too. You should try to apply for that. I think I applied two years, didn't get in, got in on the third year. Uh, this will be my third year playing in Scott Fishbowl. Um, I made it to the semifinals last year. I did. Hey. I did real good. Um, my my connection to Scott Fishbowl, like, listen, if you've met Scott, that's your connection. Yeah. Uh, it, he <laughs> is just one of the greatest people. And I really did have the just such a for fortunate relationship with him that really kind of built itself last year. There's definitely when you go to the expo, there's a there's kind of a line of I'm not going to say the younger crowd and the older crowd because that's rude, but 
I will say there's a very contingent group of dads downstairs earlier than a lot of the other people are, uh, especially the amount of um, <laughs> drinking that goes on there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and Scott was at breakfast every morning when I was there. And at first I was a little hesitant to sit down with him, but you know, and then we ended up going to target together during the week and filming a little bit of content. He was in the starts and citations videos with me. Uh, he will be in again this year when I do it. So yeah. oh. um, the connection to Scott is just fantastic. And what he does with Scott fishbowl is just unbelievable. It's the happiest donation I make every year. <laughs> 100%, 100% agree with you on that. And yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I get to do a live draft this year. I'm so excited. Yeah. Which one? You, oh, the Dallas, the one? Dallas one. Yeah. So, yeah, I was in the Orlando live draft last year and I was not able to join a live draft this year because I'm going to be in Denver, Colorado ah. when the Orlando lives are going on. Eh, so. It's OK. It's OK. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I, excited we, because I haven't gotten to experience the Scott Fishbowl. If, if this is my last, I mean, the Scott Fishbowl, I have got to experience, but not the mm -hmm. live drafting. So if this it's is fun. my only time. I'm just going to, I'm going to enjoy it. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. A little nervous about it just because I always get <laughs> nervous talking to people. So, you know, uh, <laughs> anyway, back to you. When you come up with ideas for videos, like how do you come up with what you're going to do and how do you work that? Oh man, that's, um, that's a really good question. I will tell you that I get most of my ideas when I'm in the shower. And that sounds, it's like, a, I think it's scientific, <laughs> honestly. Um, but I think every idea I've had for our Star Citizen Salutations episode has been in the shower. Uh, if that's what you're referring to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the one where I cook, where I didn't know I was cooking meth. Um, that was, <laughs> you know, that, I think that one, my mom and I were talking about my grandma making cookies. And how much we missed that because my grandma had passed on years ago. So it's not a recent thing. And I don't know what clicked on my head. to be like, man, it'd be funny if I was like cooking something then my grandma, you know, she didn't know what it was. And then it all just kind of spiraled from there. <laughs> um, but, you know, going out into nature, like I just like, like I mentioned, going on hikes with my daughter, mm -hmm. um, you know, she's filming a little bit of stuff for me this year uh, cool. because she's taken an active interest in what daddy's doing. Like she's seen these other people on YouTube as well, but she's like, daddy, I want to do some videos too. And so I've got this neat idea because she looks exactly like me, except she doesn't have a beard. <laughs> uh, of making her like the me from like 20 years ago or oh god it's more than that it was 34 so like 35 years ago like the 35 year ago joey like a little six-year-old that, so. that sounds like a brilliant idea I like it I see like that's how it happens just one little thing and then it just one little thing from there, you know? look at you yeah i don't think i could do it so you have a really creative brain and and you can tell with the whole film thing and the whole being in theater and and all that so being a big film buff let's go back to yeah. to film real quick uh mm -hmm. or maybe for a little bit uh is, you talked about watching all of those movies how do you know how many movies you've watched do you keep track of that or how do you so i am a i'm a letterbox guy there's a website okay. called letterbox to found if, if anyone's ever been on it it's fantastic you can log on your movies you can make lists it's beautiful it's a whole community there everyone's very nice uh some of the most sarcastic reviews you'll ever read but in a very loving way um i've this is my movie collection behind me there's about 1500 films um most of them are here. Some of them are box sets that are, you can't, they're off camera, but yeah, what's on screen is probably like maybe like 500 of them, but yeah, there's a ton <laughs> of movies a lot. that I have. That is, um, wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I, my grandfather, I just mentioned it the other day because Jurassic Park, it's a 30th anniversary when I was 11. He, uh, we, it was a Friday came, picked me up from my daycare because it was like the first week of summer. And he's like, we're going to the movies, Joey. We're going to go see this movie about dinosaurs. And I was like, okay. And I remember pulling up to the movie theater and seeing a line around the building and being like, oh, I've never seen that before. Like, I've been to the movies, but I've never seen a line. And I get emotional when I talk about it, but like my life changed that day. Walk and just sitting in that theater and seeing like, I mean, there were dinosaurs on the screen like we had never seen before. You know, these days, like, I, I don't like to crap on the Marvel movies because I think that's rude. But, you know, <laughs> you see so much special effects these days that it, it's kind of over. It's just kind of it kind of numbs you like there was nothing numbing about that at all. It was just it. I mean, you could hear people gasping in the theater when they showed the brontosaurus. And so like that is a core memory for me when seeing Jurassic Park with them as a kid. And so how many I've seen throughout my life? I was a film projectionist for two years at a movie theater in Orlando. Um, I got to actually build the film, um, run it, 
uh, I've worked with mostly 35 millimeter, but a couple of occasions I got to work with 70 millimeter film, which was a treat. That's, you know, as you can do the math, it's double the size. But that's like the IMAX um, frame rate. So that was super fun. I got to go to, there's a large theater called the Point Orlando and they actually have an IMAX projector which is, you wow. can't even imagine how big it <laughs> it's amazing. And but yeah, being a projectionist and actually getting to run the movies and splice them together, I get to watch them before anyone else got to because I needed to make sure that I didn't mess up my job and that I didn't mess any of the splices up. So yeah. <sighs> I worked in a movie theater too, but uh, I yeah, I did the concessions. So, you know, that's, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And every did you now guys, and then, you know, you go guys clean. All digital? uh no i don't yeah. think we were okay so you had the projectors and stuff with yeah, the actual film? yeah 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 we did yeah because i do remember those guys having a, yep okay memories coming back to me i was like 18 17 or something at that time so i don't know it was my senior in high school i got the, my second semester i got the job and i remember graduating and working through the summer at the end of the summer i just kept bugging my boss because anytime he's up in the projection room i was up there too just watching them just watching them and then when the second projectionist left, because we only had eight screens. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we needed two projectionists basically to work the week. And it was the greatest job because you'd work eight hours and you'd only actually do 45 minutes of work. And then you get to just sit in a chair and what, read books or whatever. Now, I was in the little frames watching the movies. Um, one instance we had um, when Moulin Rouge came out, there was a bend in the film. So I actually had to sit there. Because it wasn't a normal bend that you could splice out because it was like at a pivotal moment. So you couldn't take that much film out. We had to sit there and watch the whole reel go through. So once it hit that point, I had to hand feed a thing so it wouldn't catch. Oh, so wow. I watched Moulin Rouge, I want to say like seven times a week for, <laughs> I want to say we ran it for four weeks. So it must have been like almost 30 times that I saw that movie in the theaters because I had to sit there and watch it. Could you still watch it now, or is it like one of those? It is that... one of my little sister and I's favorite movies. Okay. To watch together, yeah. We, I can still, you know, movies with with music in it are easier mm -hmm. for me to rewatch for some reason. Maybe because it's I get that. Well so yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was working at the theater when that movie came out. So okay, nice. okay, okay. Time frames. All right. <laughs> so watching movies, is there a movie that you think is just like a super underrated movie that people should watch? That oh, oh. so many, so many. Okay, well, um, give me, you know, give me a couple, give me a, throw out a few and tell me, you know, which one you would definitely suggest go with that one first. You know, uh, one movie that I recommended to Simon uh, at FYF this week, and I mean, it's, it's June, so it's a little apt to mention. The movie. There's a, a rock musical that nobody really ever talks about. Um, it's from a broad musical. It's called Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it. Um, probably one of the most influential movies on who I turned out to be as a person. Um, just like my stance on love and what, I, you know, finding your one person in this world, if that exists, do you believe in that? The movie kind of explores that, but it also, you know, explores gender roles and, you know, sexuality. And I think that's really when I was 18, 19 years old, that was super important for me. And I, like I mentioned, I grew up in Montana and I never really had any access to the LGBT community. And so that was kind of my, first exposure to it and then now my little sister you know she's um she's a lesbian so that's something that we were able to bond through so it's that movie i didn't i said more of what it means to me but i mean it, the songs are hilarious uh the music's great and the story is fantastic and do you have a favorite director or that you can think of. So I know that's asking, that's asking. That's asking. That's asking. So hard question. It, my top <laughs> shelf. I put my favorite directors, and you know, I've been asked, "Okay, who's your favorite director?" And like, you know, I. It, it's tough for me to say. Hitchcock is so important to me. Um, seeing Psycho at like twelve years old was one of those. Like Jurassic Park was another one of those groundbreaking moments. Like, oh, this this is something here. Um, but for me, like Kubrick. He only made like 12 films and every one of them is perfect. He never made a bad movie. And if you look at all his films, he's made a movie pretty much in every genre that if you think of 2001, a space odyssey, one of the greatest science fiction films ever made the shining one of the greatest horror films ever made, you know? Uh, so Kubrick <laughs> is Kubrick. Just the pinnacle for me. And then I have this, I don't know if it's weird, but it's my tradition. Every mm -hmm. Christmas Eve, I watch eyes wide shut. Because it all started off as a joke with my now wife. 
that I'm like, oh yeah, I, I'm gonna watch Eyes Wide Shut on Christmas Eve. She's like, you're so weird. And then I was like, well, now I'm gonna do it. Like, every <laughs> year. and so I'll wrap my presents and I'll watch Eyes Wide Shut. And it's one of those movies like there is a lot of layers to it. So mm -hmm. you know, I'm going down rabbit holes every year. It's like, okay, what does this mean? Uh, so it's it's kind of fun that it's one of those movies that I get to do that with. Or I don't think I could watch it that many times because it's over. It's over 30 times now, probably that I've watched it in addition to the Christmas screenings, but then like, let's watch eyes wide shut. <laughs> but Kubrick, yeah, he's, he's just it for me. He's top dog. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. <laughs> Do you have a favorite genre of film? Speaking of him doing so many different genres, is there a specific genre that you enjoy the most? Um, I wouldn't say I really do love every genre. I don't, I tell you one genre I don't like is war movies, um, which is, I don't know if that says something about me. I just not huge on war movies. Um, I, I do like movies that deal with paranoia and especially, and I, I'm going to explain this through a little bit cause it's going to sound bad at first. Um, I think women portray that a lot better than men do. So I enjoy a lot of movies. Like you think of like black Swan, Rosemary's baby, where persona, uh, Ingmar Bergman film where women are dealing with paranoia. And I just think they portray it on film so much better than men. And I just get a, not a kick out of it every time, but it really just captures me every time. So I know that's not a genre, but no, but like, that's a nice expl explanation as to what you like. I get it. I get it. So that's yeah. cool. That's cool. Like when Every time a movie comes out where it's like a woman in peril, like, is she, is she really seeing things? Is she not? My friends are like, oh, you're going to see that one. I'm like, yeah, mm, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you were watching those 250 movies, the IMDb mm -hmm. movies, were there any that you were watching that you were like, hurry up and end? <laughs> so some of the silent films i'm not like sunrise like okay it's beautiful i understand how it inspired film but hurry up and end like, it's, it's a, even though i don't think it's very long even but like some of the silent ones i was like let's get through them i like the chaplin movies a lot so i wasn't really wanting to rush through those but there were some war movies that yeah you know <laughs> three and a half four hours like oh yeah all right were there this many battles come on you could have just cut a couple of them out <laughs> <laughs> probably historical but um yeah <laughs> but the, yeah the any of the war movies i was probably like let's let's push through these but like yeah I get the you godfather like give me another 40 minutes of the godfather i'll sit there and watch it <laughs> yeah that's good i mean i was gonna ask is there a movie that should be longer so <laughs> that that yeah i mean you know i think that yeah i don't know because I, I don't watch a lot of movies i have a really hard time focusing on anything that's longer than 30 minutes so uh, no I, <laughs> I get it there's there's a real divide not a not in a bad way but like i think television and movies really it's much more fluid now than it used to be where it used to be mm -hmm. a very like clear line between the two um but i mean just it was about five years ago what my favorite tv series of all times twin peaks and they had twin peaks the return on showtime and david lynch who created twin peaks came out and said this is an 18 minute film or 18 hour film this is not a 18 you know episode series and it very much when you watch it it does feel yeah like that so. so i should just watch movies and just take a little break every now and then just break it up and there we go. I can get through it. There, there are some directors that are a little long winded and I would never <laughs> tell them that to that to their face, but like, you know, sometimes you don't need two hours and 45 minutes to tell your story. You can tell it in two fifteen. like two fifteen is my, my sweet spot. It's a sweet like, spicy spot. movie is two fifteen. I'm like, Oh, I'll put it on. But there's definitely movies that I've been like, all right, I'm going to put this one on hold because it's two 30 or two 45. Yeah. I'll eventually get to it. But I like that access to being like, all right, I'm going to just hop into this right now. Right on, right on. Are you, you brought up TV as well. Do you watch a lot of TV, a little bit of TV, or are you more of movie movies? Um, I would say the pie to bring the pie back. Um, I would say the, the pie would be about 90 movies, 10 TV. Right. I usually do about one new series a year. And then I've got my ones that I kind of keep up with, but are really not that much. Um, I watched the righteous gemstones. Um, I really enjoy that. Um, I, the rehearsal, which Nathan Fielder just did on, um, HBO max. Uh, it's well, I have HBO max. I guess it's on HBO, but it's funny. Most of the shows I watch are on HBO. I'm starting secession oh, in a couple okay. of weeks, which I've heard is fantastic, and, yeah. but I've wanted to wait till it was all over so I could just binge it straight through. So that makes sense. 
Yeah, but as football so, season gets here, I probably won't get season. to watch much TV. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you about football season, watching football with you. When, if somebody, if there was a fly on the wall, just watching you watch football, what would, what would it be seeing going on? How are you when you're watching a football game? Um, I'm, I'm into it. I, if it's a single game, I'm a little more second screenish. I'll say that like, I've got, you know, my phone while we texting people and whatnot, but on Sundays, I've got the red zone on usually. And then I've got another game because I have two monitors. I'll have the game on during the season with Front Yard Fantasy. I was doing the FanDuel show. And so I would have three games I'd have to report on, usually one or two early games and one afternoon game. So I'd have the one of the early games on a screen and then red zone. And I would just be glued into it. I wouldn't even really look at my fantasy scores until the end of the day. Um, Sunday night comes and that's kind of my time to chill. Like, okay, the Sunday night football game's on. Let me pull my scores up. Let me see where I was at. But, you know, I was sitting in that chair. My wife would joke that she was going to get me one of those little bags where you, you pee in them. Like those, <laughs> a catheter. To, yeah. Because I would sit in the chair and I had my Buffalo dip and I would eat my snacks and just be glued to those two screens all day and taking notes and whatnot, but not really checking all my scores until the end of the day, which is always kind of a fun little right to the end of Sunday. And then I get to look at my scores and see how bad I'm getting beat. <laughs> well, at least you're not stressing about it all day and going, oh, man, oh, man. I mean, I Maybe. didn't say I wasn't stressing about it. Well, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> so do you still watch college football? Are you watching college football? Um, when it's on? I'll be honest. I do not watch enough college football. Uh, I, I'm I'm fortunate to be like in a group of, I don't even, I would say for, I work with most of them now football guys with Jeff Bell. Um, who just really is in that Debbie community so much. So a lot of what Jeff Bell kind of puts out about the rookies, I make little notes about, uh, cause he's just really right. honestly, for me, one of the like uh, most authorities on college football that I go to the most. And so I don't get to watch as much because I really do push Saturday towards the family. Now, if it's a big game that everyone's talking about, I'll definitely tune in for it, but I don't get to see as much. It's usually in once the season's over, I'll start looking into, okay, now let's look at these rookies watching tape and whatnot. Are you in different kinds of leagues? What kind of leagues are you in? So, yeah, I mean, I'm in dynasty, uh, redraft, best ball. I mean, you name it, I'm in it. The only ones I've not, I've not crossed the barrier to is those Debbie leagues. I've not, I've not had the courage to do it. Any of the camp, campus to Canton or any of those yet. <laughs> uh, that's probably the next step. Uh, mm -hmm. I really, this was the first season that I really looked into rookies. Uh, thanks a lot to Alfredo Brown on the launch pad with football guys. Uh, he had me on so many times just talking rookies and it really made me dive into them. And normally I'm someone that just kind of looks at the stats. And I said to Alfredo, I really want to try something this year where I'm just going to watch a lot more film and then look at the stats. And it was a really, really fun exercise that I really found myself enjoying. And I think I'll be doing that a lot more. Uh, cause you know, I don't know if there's a criticism of just their stat guys and there's film guys, but you kind of really do need to have a little bit of both. Yeah, so. I agree. I agree. I like a nice healthy balance there when mm -hmm. it <laughs> comes to that. If you were putting out content that was not even related to fantasy football and not film related anymore, but you had to pick another topic. Is there anything that you think that you would be at least decent at like you could put out some content you're a very funny guy so i think you could put out the content but is there something that you think you'd have yeah it'd be good so if i had to write about another i won't even call it a sport because i don't want to i don't want to get your um i don't want to get the podcast any uh hate mail but it, <laughs> I, to be able to write about pro wrestling to put my spin on it um i think pro wrestling is so exciting uh, and not necessarily the pro wrestling you see on American television, but uh, the Japanese pro wrestling to me, um, how it's respected in their culture. Um, the performance of it is so interesting and so exciting. Um, there's a major promotion called New Japan Pro Wrestling. I think if I could write about any other sport, it would probably be new, just straight up New Japan Pro Wrestling. Um, just you go to pro wrestling events in the United States and everyone's hooting and hollering with signs and in Japan, it's very, very respectful. Oohs and ahs. And if it gets loud, for any that's a once in a decade type event where people get extremely loud. Um, it, it's respected. The 
the wrestlers are seen as true athletes in their country. And it's just really, really neat to see. And something I would love to write about. As far as like outside of writing about a specific topic to like be more creative, um, you know, like getting to do starts and salutations has really started to, instead of just watching a movie, I will be like, oh, I want to do something like that. I want to take that scene the way that was shot. And I want to do, so it's kind of probably like awoken something in me that was always there to want to make something i don't know what that is um i've written like plays and screenplays and and whatnot but something will probably come of it one day but just not sure what that is yet cool we're looking forward to it we'll have you come back <laughs> whenever that comes out we'll talk about that as well but what got you into wrestling like what piqued your interest on that i mean i think we live in a in a world today where we see superhero movies on the screen we didn't have that when i was a kid and <laughs> Whether it was natural or not, we have these larger than life, if you want to call them athletes, but these professional wrestlers. And they were kind of like real life superheroes, um, you know, where, you know, all the kids were you know, Hulk Hogan. And stuff. I was always, always a kid. I never liked Hulk Hogan. I liked this guy, Rowdy Roddy Piper, um, because he was really good on the microphone. He used his humor to get through instead of his physicality. But then you would, you know, you get physical, too. And he'd always cheat. He'd poke in the eyes. And I thought that was really funny. Uh you know, as a kid, I was I was allowed to watch it. Once again, I had a cool mom that was like, cool right, you can tolerate it. <laughs> um, so I watched, you know, pro wrestling. It was something my stepfather and I really bonded over when my mom met someone new. He liked pro wrestling. The first time I ever remember meeting him, um, my mom took me to this little pro wrestling event that was local. And he was there. I come to find out that was how my mom was going to introduce us. I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> That's how but no, I mean, we went to... You know, my stepfather and I went to pro wrestling events for, God, 25, 30 years together. Yeah, just about 30 years together. He passed away last year. Um, and we went to Royal Rumble, went to uh, one of the most important moments in pro wrestling history was I mentioned Hulk Hogan always being the good guy. Mm -hmm. When he finally turned bad at Bash at the Beach, we were there in Daytona Beach when he dropped the boot is what they said. He turned out to be the third man with the New World Order. Uh, we were there that night. So that's like a huge moment in pro wrestling history. We were there for, but we would go see like the local wrestling. We'd go see the NXT, which is like the um, developmental for WWE. Um, and then when new Japan started bringing events to the United States, I was actually able to take him to a few of those before he passed away. Um, because that's where my, I always kind of loved pro wrestling when I was a kid. Then I kind of got away from it for a little while. And it wasn't until the morning of my wedding when I couldn't sleep and a friend's like, Hey, it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm up watching this new Japan pro wrestling. Like you should watch it. It's, it's really different. And I'm like, well, I'm getting married in like X number of hours and I can't go to sleep. Let me turn it on. And it was like, just like, wow, what it was so different. And what so. is an experience like going to the actual live <laughs> event? I, I tell everyone, um, even if you don't like pro wrestling, you got to go see it live one time just for the spectacle depending on the region, the country you're in, um, down here in Florida in the South, people take it way too seriously than they should. Um, and I kind of like to poke the bear a little bit. So when I go to a pro wrestling event, I always cheer for the bad guys, no matter who, who's there, I'll cheer for the bad guy every time. Cause there's always some little kid that will get really, really mad at me. And I think that's funny. <laughs> and I never go too far with it. I always keep it. I always keep it PG, but like I boo the good guys and cheer for the bad guys. But they, they tend to interact with the crowd a little bit more. Um, you see all walks of life at a pro wrestling event. Um, I was at, when I was at WrestleMania, uh, it was the first and only WrestleMania I went to, and probably the last one I go to. It's just much larger than I like to experience. You know, you, I see the people that I would see at my local events. I see, you know, athletes and whatnot. I go to the bathroom, and as I'm walking out, Rick Rubin, the music producer, is walking in. And I was wow. like, what the heck? <laughs> and I, I got to talk to Rick Rubin for like Holy two minutes. Holy crud. That's so, dope. And it's just like an interaction. I was watching a documentary today and Rick Rubin was in. That's kind of that's why I top of my head. And it's like, where else in the world would I have just bumped into a music producer? But at, like at a honestly at a pro wrestling event, because it's like truly all walks of life are there. Wow. That's a super yeah. dope story. Yeah, for yeah. sure. For <laughs> sure. So is there anybody famous, maybe... I'm trying to think, is there anybody in film that you would want to meet if you had the opportunity to? 
<sighs> man. <laughs> So many. Uh, or we could do this I, whole if you sat down at a table with this nah, many people for dinner. No, but yeah, who you got? So I I actually had the the fortune of meeting like one of my favorite actors. I mentioned Mark Duplass earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I got to sit at a table with Mark Duplass at a screening of the Puffy Chair, which was one of his first independent films at the Florida Film Festival. A friend set it up uh, where he was doing a Q and A, and um, I got to sit at the table with him. I got to talk to him about fifteen minutes before the movie started. Um, had a really great interaction, actually told him that my wife was at home pregnant. Um, and we talked about, you know, like fatherhood a little bit. And then I think one of the uh, members from the, it's called the Enzian. It's like a film community here in Orlando. It's like an independent film house. Um, I think he dropped a word to one of them to say, Hey, when his wife has the baby, send them something. Cause we got some flowers from them, which I thought was pretty. Oh, cool. wow. Yeah. That is but I don't, super cool. I, yeah, no big deal. he is, could not have been <laughs> nicer. Uh, you know, I always like it when um because I've I've met a lot of film directors and a lot of actors and it's been a good experience most of the time. When they call you over to get the picture, it always means a little bit more than if you're like, Hey, can I get a picture? Yeah. And Mark saw me kind of like walking off to the side and he's like, Joey, before we go, let's get a picture. And I was like, Oh my god. Wow. That, that's yeah. it right there. It does make you just uh, so, go, and, oh and like forever, I will I will anything he puts out, I will go. <laughs> but definitely it would be definitely a director. It, if I could sit down with Tarantino, I think I would just have the best lunch in the world. And honestly, I probably wouldn't even talk that much. I would probably just sit there and listen uh, there. If there's one person I could listen to talk, it's Quentin Tarantino uh, for, you know, I'll listen to him on a podcast or on an interview. And he will talk about 80 movies that I've never seen. And he will <laughs> talk to them about like, they're his firstborn child, like that much passion and love in it. And anyone that has that in them, I would just love to sit down with. And he makes really cool movies too. <laughs> and he makes really cool movies too. Yeah. That doesn't hurt. That doesn't hurt. So bringing up fatherhood and the fact that you have a wife and a family, how does your wife feel about this? I know that she's supportive, but when you first were like, Hey, I'm putting out fantasy football content. What was that like? She could not have been more supportive. Um, like, honestly, like I outkick my coverage big time when it comes <laughs> to wives in the looks department and like the type of person she is, she is, Every bit that's good of me, she's 10 times better. And I'm not saying that just because she's going to listen to this. Um, <laughs> because the only shows she'll listen to are the ones that I kind of talk about the family. The ones I talk about football, she don't listen to those. Um, well, she does watch the Starks and Citations. Hello. Yeah. hello and to I your wife. Her so. <laughs> name's Bethany. So, yeah. Bethany, um, thanks for listening, Bethany. Yeah, any any type of endeavor I want to do, she's super supportive of. And I feel bad a lot of times. Like when I, when I left to do the show tonight, one of our kids was acting up. And I'm like... I said to her, I was like, this is what makes it hard sometimes to leave. And she's like, go, like, you're going to this, you get them tomorrow night. And yeah. so <laughs> just to be able to like pass off like that and not make me feel guilty for coming and doing what I love just means the world. And I, I try to let her do what she loves, but she gets to do it too. But sadly, just there's so many more things that, that seem to be coming up right now for me that it's yeah. just super exciting. But she is like, the other day I got invited to New York to participate in some fantasy leagues. Oh. Um, and she's like, go, like, book it. we'll figure it out. Like, <laughs> awesome. let's go. Can't pass this up. I'm like, All right. So she's usually the first person saying yes to these things and not me. Although I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I don't bring her the things I want her to say no to. I, only <laughs> to yes to. I love that. Does she, uh, does she listen, listen, does she watch film with you when you're watching film and has yes. she watched all 250 of the ones you watched but <laughs> she watches a lot of the movies that i watch i'll have to say um i mean with the kids we don't get to i kind of pick and choose for a little bit not mm -hmm. to say i curate my wife's movie watching ability because that's not true but like there's a movie called past lives coming out like i have movies that i save for her that i'm like these are the ones that we're gonna love to watch together um it's a funny movie memory um we it's one of the rare times that we went and saw something separate from each other. She went and saw Lava Land before me. And usually I'm the one that sees it first. And she's went and saw it and she came back and she's like, honey, that movie was amazing. And she loves Ryan Gosling. So I'm like, <laughs> all right, is it just Gosling? And right? she's like, no, I'm telling you, Joey, you're going to love it. It's got like that old Hollywood to it. I think you're really going to like it. And I went and saw it and I was so happy in the theater seeing it. But then I got so sad because she wasn't there to share it with me. Aww. Like I did, I get, I got like just sad about that. Um, because we do like when there's something that we love seeing together, like 
it's kind of nothing better. Like we went yeah. for my 30th birthday to Tampa to see Casablanca on, on an actual big screen on in the theater. And it was at the Tampa theater where I actually performed at in high school and they show repertory screenings on the weekends. Um, so they showed Casablanca, then organ player come out uh, 20 minutes before the movie and play um, some of the music from the film. Um, just one of the most beautiful experiences. And that was a movie that when our relationship first started, I was living in Cocoa Beach, Florida, and she was living in Orlando. And we would watch on the phone together, just like in When Harry Met Sally. So just <laughs> our whole lo- our Aww. whole marriage is connected kind of through the movies. And our our theme of our wedding was movies on every table. Uh, for everyone was sitting at there was a different movie that we have recreated the uh, pick the uh, picture from like we have Bull Durham and when Harry met Sally um, Annie Hall which we're not allowed to talk about Annie Hall anymore but <laughs> <laughs> at that time we were allowed to talk about it so um, that was a big important movie to us but we don't talk about Annie Hall anymore so, mm. <laughs> so when you had your I heard that well see the thing is I hear that marriage and and weddings I, I've been married, so I am still mm-hmm. married. And when we got married, we had music that played a big role in our wedding. So did you have songs that were important to your wedding? Yeah. So my wife's awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I um, She wanted to walk down the aisle to Shelter by Ray LaMontagne, which was a concert that we, um, when our relationship first started, <laughs> I just broke up with this one girl. And my wife and I, we had been off and on, off and on, and we're going to now give it another try. And we took this trip to Georgia to go to see this concert for Ayla Montaigne because our friend was opening for him at the Tabernacle in Atlanta. And one of the songs he sang there that day was our first dance song. But, um, oh, no, 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 sorry. That was a song that she walked down the aisle to. But there's a point in the wedding where the groomsmen and, and I get to walk down. And I was just kind of going through everything. I was just like, what am I going to do? Like, what do I want to walk down to? Do I want it to be funny? And there was always this piece of music that I loved. Um, and my favorite movie is Almost Famous. And it's called Cabin in the Air. And Nancy Wilson um, from Heart um, wrote the song. She was married to the director, Cameron Crowe. And I always loved that little piece of music. But it was impossible to find in 2014. Now, since the films have, like, I think it's the 20th anniversary, they've released a vinyl that has Cabin in the Air on it. But at that time, you could not get that piece of music anywhere. So I actually sent a um, email to, I want to say it was like one of the, the music producers to see they get it for me. And they actually got me in touch with Nancy Wilson, who sent me a copy of the song. Wow. And that's what my grooms and I walked down to at my wedding. That is so cool. So, yeah, so- that was. And so it was so cool to be able to get that. Just And it was just like an MP3 file. It was no yeah. trouble for them to send it to me. Like, And it was just, but for me. It was like a piece of music you could not find anywhere that was, you know, that we got to have for our day. So that was really great. And then when our grooms, when we walked in at the uh, reception, all of the bridal party walked into the Jurassic Park theme. And then my wife and I walked into the Raiders March from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, so, wow. That sounds like a really movie. fun wedding. Yeah, it was fun. Oh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> so, okay. When you have free time, I know we've been talking about things that you like to do, but is there ever something that like you look forward to something that you really enjoy doing that when it happens, you're just like, this is like the best. And I mean this in like the most, like the sweetest way, like time alone with my wife, like when you have two kids, it it gets tough. So every time we get a date night or we get a weekend away last year, we went to Denver, Colorado for my 40th birthday weekend. And she planned it all. I had no idea where we were going until about three months beforehand. I was like, okay, you got to tell me where we're going. And she started dropping hints like, okay, we're, we're, you know, it's this, it's in this region. It's, and I'm like, I landed on Colorado and I'm like, why are we going to Colorado? Like, yeah, I, I love the mountains, but like, why is it? And she's like, it's movie related. And as soon mm. as she said that, I was like, The Shining. Uh, the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park is where Stephen King wrote The Shining. And I'm like, The Shining, if I can mention Kubrick, yeah, it's like, it's one of the most important movies to me. And, um, yeah, so time alone with my wife, like that Denver trip was incredible and we've got a weekend away. We're just doing like a little local weekend here away in September, right before the season starts to kind of just, <sighs> yeah, exactly. Right it's needed too. It's needed, um, so. <laughs> yeah. So time away with her is probably the thing I look forward to most in this world. I love my kids. I do, but like that special time I go with my wife, it's, it's, it's really great. Well, 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 and we know she's listening. So she's just like, 
taking mm. it all in. Thanks for all the compliments. <laughs> this is great. My wife would be like, well, she was on another podcast. So <laughs> yay. I mean, um, she's probably but, saying that too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My wife's like, really seriously? And I'm like, dude, you were supposed I said, and she's like, don't call me dude. But she's like, <laughs> I don't have Pilates today. Well, I'm sorry. There's only so much I can do. But I also I just wanted to thank you so much. I have such a hard time scheduling people for this podcast. That's one of the trillion reasons why this podcast comes out so sporadically. But you were such an easy, easy person to deal with. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to say thank you for being able to get the scheduling to work. I appreciate that flexibility of time and everything. I mean, I, I got to meet you at Expo last year and I was I was super excited. And then I I want to say a few months ago, you, you kind of mentioned like, hey, I, I want to I was some joke I meant I made mm -hmm. on your Twitter feed. And you're like, oh, my goodness, I need to get you on the show. And I was like, whenever. And I didn't want to push the issue. Yeah. I was like, yeah, she'll reach out whenever she really? did. And I was like, yes. And uh, like Simon yeah. from FYF, he was pumped when I told him I was going to be doing the show with the oh, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, I met him there too. You guys are all such, such wonderful people. So I, I we try. Yeah, <laughs> we try. So, okay, fantasy football, back to that. We're going to talk about, well, you, you talked about the kind of leagues you're in. Do you, are you one of those people that counts how many leagues you're in or knows how many leagues you're in? Or I mean, do you have a basic ballpark estimate of how many leagues you're in? Too many. Too but many if I had answer. taking best ball out of it um, between the redraft and the charity leagues and my home leagues, 25 to 30, probably too many. Like I said, yeah. I, I really need every year. I'm like, I'm going to cut them down. I'm going to cut them down. But Jeff Bell keeps saying, Hey, Joey, come join this come dynasty join draft. This? Startup oh, I know I'm getting that right now from people. I'm like, I'm not going to join any more leagues. I think we're, we're, just, we're in a league. Yeah. Um, what's her Heather, uh, Heather started up. No, Rachel. From Expo. Um, oh, yeah. Pop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You started a league. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were in that together last yeah, year. Yeah, 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 yeah. See? And, yeah. It is hard to say no to some leagues. I, yeah, I, I, especially, especially when, yeah, I know, right? See, uh, and the people, again, from the Expo. So, man, Bob's going to, Bob, Bob Long is going to, he's going to just be like, thanks for promoting so much. You're welcome, Bob. We should get, we should get free Expo tickets for as much as we said Expo during Yeah, that. right? Come on, Bob. Bob. Come on, Bob. I played I played cornhole with Bob at FSGA yeah. this year. I should, you know, I'm gonna send this to him. <laughs> Better. <laughs> Listen, what's up? What's up? So when you go to the expo, since we're talking about that again, mm -hmm. do you is there a specific thing that you looked forward to the most or something that was like an, a surprising experience for you while you were there? Um, I mean, the first year was I was like the King's Classic is my most important thing I need to go to. Uh, you know, in this last year that I went, I was, I was really just, oh, so yeah, the last year, uh, JL got sick and he couldn't make it out there. And so there was only going to be a couple representatives from FYF there. So I kind of took it upon myself that like, I'm going to just go shake every hand and meet everyone, which I'm a very friendly person, but to be like, hi, I'm Joey Wright from front yard fantasy. You know, who are you? It's a little different than, you know, being from a business stance. And I loved it. I just love the networking aspect of yeah. it. So I really look forward to that going into day two after day one. Like I was out of bed that next morning, like, let's go, let's meet some people. And like, I was, you know, saying hi to everybody and with like no fear at all, which, you know, before I'd have, a, I was a little timid, like for mm -hmm. the first year, like I was terrified to go say hi to Scott fish. And now I'm terrified to say hi to him for different reasons, but it has nothing to do with that. <laughs> I forgot that part of this podcast is helping people out who are just starting in the industry or are just starting putting out content that kind of want to, I didn't forget. I just, we, we've, we've been talking about so many awesome things, but yeah. do you have a piece of advice for somebody that wants to start putting out content, but they just don't know where to start or what to do or how to go about it? Yeah. I mean, just kind of tailing off what I just said with network um, and just be positive. Like there's so much negativity out there. Don't do that. I mean, just yeah. be, just be open be positive. Um, if somebody's got some suggestions for you and even I'm guilty of this now, I mean, try to listen as much as possible. Um, feedback. It's, it's something that JL and I talk about a lot and I'm like, I have a hard time with feedback hearing, you know, whether it's negative or positive, because I just don't know how to take it. Um, but learning how to take that feedback. But as far as where to start out, there's a lot of places that are just looking for someone to write an article, a little blurb. I mean, right. look out for it. It's not, it's not really, I wouldn't say it's not hard to find, but if you look, it's there. 
Um, but networking is the biggest thing I can kind of push because I was fortunate to get that little spot with brass ball. Like mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't say a little spot, but I was fortunate to get a spot with them. But in that was me networking in inside of that industry tournament. Had I mm -hmm. not done that, I, I wouldn't have got that spot. But even after that, getting to meet all the people I did. I mean, Jay Felicio was one of the first people. I'm lucky I get to work with him now. And he blows up my phone every day. And I don't hate that at all. It's a good thing. Um, but Jay, I mean, was the first person to bring me on a show and just sit in a mock draft. And I was terrified, sweating through my clothes. <laughs> and now I get on a show and I blah, 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 blah. But, you know, just having a blast. So. Having a blast is how it should be. So mm -hmm. it, it, that's excellent. Before we go, I want, first, I wanted to say thanks again for coming on this podcast and talking with okay. me. It's been so fun. I, I've enjoyed every moment of it. I usually can't find someone to sit there and listen to me for this long. So oh, I, I know I've gone off the rails and I've gone off no, topic. No, you're good. I'm I've always forgotten what the question is, but I'm having a blast. I forget half the questions I ask as I'm yeah. asking them. So it's okay. And my wife's probably like, why do you listen to the people on your podcast, but you won't listen to me? I don't want to talk. I'm like, always like, huh? Huh? But huh? anyway, I got to listen to you and, and you had a lot of really cool stuff. And I, the Rick Rubin thing, I'm not going to get over. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Can you go ahead, uh, just let everybody know where they can find you, what kind of stuff you have out there and all of that stuff. Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter at the joy, right. And pretty much any social media I that's out there. I have at the joy, right. Tagged. Um, I'm not on Facebook or anything, but just mainly you can reach out to me on Twitter. My DMS are open. So if you have any fantasy questions, questions, of how to get started in the industry tips, anything you need please DM me. I mean, I respond to the robots because I think it's funny <laughs> to respond to them about yes. fantasy questions. If you send me an actual question, I will absolutely respond. So you can find me on Twitter at the joy, right? I do work with front yard fantasy. I'm on their fantasy wall game show every day at three o'clock and you are more than welcome to come join us one day, uh, hey. three to at three o'clock. And we play games like uh, fantasy fortune, fantasy jeopardy, which are popular versions of uh, fantasy versions of the popular game shows that you've seen out there. Uh, we just start a little twist and our little humor. Um, so that's every day at three o'clock, Monday through Friday. Uh, I do Friday night mocks with Jay Felicio every Friday at nine 30. And then we have pub trivia every Monday night. I'm a busy guy <laughs> yeah, eight it does sound like it. on the better sports network and front yard fantasy. And then I am writing now with football guys and I'm on the pretend yeah. GM podcast with uh, Alfredo Brown. And I just did a, a three part series. I was supposed to be on three parts, but I got sick. So it was only on two parts of the launch pad with uh, one of my best friends in the industry and someone that really, really, really has gone out of his way to just open doors for me. And that's Dave Kluge. Yep. Uh, who uh, you've had him on your show yep. before. And I told him I was coming on tonight. He's like, Joey, have a blast. He was so excited. I get to see <laughs> him in a month. I can't wait to see him. Oh, him that's going to be fun. Yeah. Aww. So we saw him last year in Colorado. So we could see him again this year. Super excited. Yeah. So you can catch me at football guys. I got articles coming out this summer. I'm on the pretend GM with Alfredo Brown. And then I will have start sitting salutations coming back. It's a labor of love and it's a large labor to get those episodes out. Um, but I am going to get some out this year uh, during this season uh, because they are just too much fun to shoot uh, with my friends. And I love that people get joy out of them. And that's really all I want to do is make people happy. So yep, that's where you can find me. And that's all that I have really going on. I can't wait to see what you have in store for all of us, especially with that the video ideas that you have. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So everyone, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Get Real with Casey Kasem. And, you know, make sure you go follow Joey. Make sure you tell him you got real with him. And also remember to come back again for another episode of Get Real with Casey Kasem and stay rad. <laughs>